As with the dynamic model, there are many issues associated with these IMUs, especially these cheap MEMS-based ones. The first is that these IMUs all take measurements with respect to the robot's local frame, not with respect to a global frame. It doesn't tell you. The accelerations, for example, only tell you whether you're moving in the X or Y local frame, not the global X or Y frame. More about that soon. As well, the Earth's magnetic field is certainly not consistent. In fact, it can be easily corrupted by putting large metal objects all around. You get a large drift. All your accelerometer measurements can actually drift over time. This will lead to accumulations and errors. For example, at one point, you might calibrate your accelerometer to be zero when it's not moving. The next thing you know, it's slightly off. Even if the accelerometer is not moving, it produces this small value of acceleration. And your robot then will think it is actually accelerating and say, well, I must be moving forward. And over time, this will predict the robot is moving forward hundreds of meters away, even though it hasn't moved one centimeter. So both the dynamic model and the IMU gave you some accelerations and orientations, but they didn't exactly give you positions yet. So let's talk now about how you might get position from these types of acceleration orientation measurements. So here's our problem. We're given acceleration and orientation measurements, but we need to calculate the robot's position. How do we do that? Well, we're going to start by using coordinate frames. First, we'll note that we can represent the position of a robot, or we'll say vehicle to be more general, in the 3D sense with some vector, let's call it R, that's got an XYZ component using a Cartesian coordinate frame. You're probably familiar with such Cartesian coordinate frames. But we also have to represent the vehicle or robot with angles. In this case, we're going to use orientation angles yaw, pitch, and roll, alpha, beta, gamma. This is another vector. So we've got x, y, z, alpha, beta, gamma so far to represent our state of our robot. Now where do we place the origin? In one case, we're going to actually fix the origin someplace in the world, maybe a launch pad, maybe the end of a dock, something that we think is static with respect to the world. And we're going to call this particular frame that's anchored to a part of the world, like the end of a dock, as the global or inertial coordinate frame. And the robot then can move around with respect to that fixed coordinate frame. Note that in this particular coordinate frame, we've got the subscript G for global. However, we can also place a second coordinate frame right on the vehicle itself. In this case, you see that the X coordinate is aligned with the forward direction of the robot, Z is down, and Y is in the lateral direction with respect to the robot. But again, we've got a global frame attached to the Earth and a local frame attached to the robot. Now we're going to have to notice that there's clearly a difference between these two coordinate frames and they're not going to have the same measurements all the time or same representations. And we often will want to represent a transformation between these two frames or rotation because if this robot moves then this X will rotate with respect to this X. So the transformations, there are two types. We can have rotations. So we can have our robot's frame rotate with respect to the global frame in all three directions, roll, pitch, and yaw. But we can also have a translation where the robot's position, hence the robot's local frame, translates with respect to the global coordinate frame. Let's talk a bit more about the rotations. In 2D, this is pretty easy to understand and even derive mathematically with our skills. Let's say we've got this vector represented in our XY frame. We can rotate it an angle alpha to Q2. So Q1 was rotated to Q2. And we could do that with this simple rotation matrix. You probably encountered this early in your university career or even back in high school. We can rewrite this R as a function of alpha as our rotation matrix. Hence, we can take any point in our coordinate frame and rotate it to a new point. Note that we're rotating about the origin. Now let's say we've got a rocket that we're shooting off and we've got its acceleration. We might want to know 
its acceleration with respect to this global coordinate frame, you know, with respect to its launch pad, for example. But if we use IMUs, we're taking measurements with respect to its local frame. We probably fixed our RMU with accelerometers facing in this direction and maybe this direction, but not with respect to the global frame. So if we've got measurements in the local frame, we need to somehow transform them to coordinates in the global frame. So what do we need to do? We need to rotate those acceleration measurements that were taken in the local frame to a global frame. Here's another way to look at it. We had an IMU on board. It measured acceleration in the x direction, of course, with respect to the rocket's local frame, and we measured acceleration with respect to the y direction of the rocket's local frame. Of course, what we really want to know is what is the acceleration in the global frames so we know where the rocket is accelerating in the global world. But we can take these local frame acceleration measurements, multiply them by the rotation measurement to get them in the global frame. Simple as that. Now this can also be done in three dimensions. In fact, we just do one rotation for each axis. We know that we know that the rocket or robot's local frame can be rotated in three different directions with respect to the global frame, so we just account for each one of those three directions. So if we've got a vector, whether it's an acceleration measurement or a point or whatever, and we want to rotate it in three dimensions, we can actually rotate it about the x-axis the y-axis and the z-axis. Roll, pitch, and yaw. Now we can actually multiply these all together to get one large rotation matrix so that we can take any vector and rotate it through roll, pitch, and yaw to get another vector. And in the same way, we can take three-dimensional acceleration measurements in a local frame, rotate them to get them into the global frame. Now why are we doing this? getting local acceleration measurements into global frame measurements, this is going to help with our prediction step. So, at every time step, when we take an IMU measurement of acceleration, we're going to take those accelerations, we're going to convert them to a global frame, and integrate them twice. So, if we take accelerations from our model, or IMU, in the local frame, we'll rotate them to get them into our global frame, and then we do some approximations to integrate them to get velocity in the global frame and again to get position in the global frame so we can figure out where the robot or rocket moved in the global world. So that was all prediction. That was predicting where the robot could move to at every time step. In our first example, we counted wheels rotations to predict where the robot went. However, we just talked about two other methods using a dynamic model and an IMU. But don't forget, the errors will grow with those types of prediction methods. So we might want some infrastructure, some sort of GPS system to get a measurement that is an absolute measurement of where the robot is. And then we need to somehow combine the predicted with the absolute measurement. And that's what state estimation will do. Now before we go on and move to the correction side of things and the types of correction measurements we might get, let's just note the types of prediction errors and how they really can grow unbounded. Well, let's look at this particular equation. We predicted the position of our robot in the global frame was our last position, adding to it how fast the robot was moving times how long it was moving for. Seems pretty basic. But how much error should we associate with this position? Well, using our basic propagation of error equation from earlier in the course, we note that the error, or squared error, associated with this position is going to be a function of the error associated with the previous position and the error associated with the velocity, assuming that we know the time step perfectly. Now these errors are related through the sensitivity functions or derivatives. Well, how sensitive is our position to our previous position? That's what this captures. And of course, you should be able to take derivatives at this point. But what you'll see is this error is a function of the previous error. And that term is a function of the error before it. And so on and so on. So every error is going to 
be a function of the previous error. And this error will then obviously accumulate over and over and over as for every time step. And as time goes on, these errors will accumulate and grow and grow and grow. Doesn't seem good. And that's why we need correction. So to summarize, we talked about state estimation in this video, which is typically broken down into two steps, a prediction and correction step. Each one of these steps has different sensors it will leverage. Today we talked about the prediction sensors. And in the next video, you'll talk about some of the correction sensors. But the key thing to remember is that these predictions have errors that will grow unbounded.